myself again But it's the only way you're ever gonna learn You look back and it's all in the past I'm dwelling on the thoughts I cannot say to you If I don't say the words then maybe it's not true Good evening, welcome along to NUFC Matters with me, Steve Wraith We're not actually here, but we are here if that makes sense, because it's a pre-recorded show uh, done on Tuesday night for Wednesday. So please don't be offended when I don't answer the questions. I don't put any uh, things on screen uh, because it isn't actually live. It is a pre-record. Uh, George, though, uh, we've still got Ask George. And tonight, the panel have got a question each for George. So uh, yeah. Mitch is uh, rubbing his hands with glee at this one. Like God knows what we'll get out of uh, Mitch on, on that score uh, to his dad. But we will wait and see. Uh, but let's start with Newcastle United. We've got now a chat about Newcastle United and uh, Newcastle going to Tottenham Hotspur, Al Waleed, um, one of the top four. And Newcastle put themselves into the top four with a with a fantastic result. It's uh, been a while since we uh, we went over uh, Tottenham, and I'm really happy for that. And uh, uh, I remember uh, the takeover first game with the Spurs last last year. Uh, it was all, uh, uh, we were happy, even we were lost. And uh, this is after, after, and we get the, uh, the revenge. We win finally against the Spurs. And uh, it should be winning that time. When, uh, but that time, maybe uh, Bruce was sacked. So uh, maybe that last uh, did help, help us uh, last year. Uh, it was a game, amazing game. Everybody, uh, I think, uh, saw the new Newcastle, and uh, uh, really, the teams are, should be afraid from us now. Uh, you, you mentioned that game uh, last season, Al Waleed, and to be honest, I think Eddie Howe used that five-one defeat against Tottenham away last season uh, as a bit of a, a bit of a G up to the team. I think he tried to motivate the team by reminding them what the result was last season. Uh, Eddie Howe, he's a brilliant manager and he used to have a little bit of tools uh, and uh, a low quality player, but he has a great mind. And when he has the, the best tools, best players, uh, things reflect on the field. Uh, he plays in a unique way. And uh, Conti, I think he, le he learned the lesson yesterday. Yeah, OK. Great stuff. Happy with the result. Mitch, it was uh, a prediction, um, which I got right at the weekend. I changed my mind on the Wednesday. I felt it was going to be 2-2. Went for 2-1 on the Amigos. But, uh, yeah, what a what a win. And, and, and lots to talk about with the game, I guess. Um, Callum Wilson, big talking point. I thought he was superb. Uh, another fantastic all-round game. But the fact that he didn't do what a lot of forwards would have done, I guess, in, in that um, position he found himself in, in, in that collision with the keeper. He could have gone down, but that goal scoring instinct was to stay on his feet and, and you know, take the opportunity that, that befell him. And um, VAR tried to choke it off, not once, not twice, but on three different things. Uh, but, you know, it was a perfectly good goal and it stood. And Al Niron, wow, um, he's in such a rich vein of form. How many times we've sat on this platform and said, you know, Al Niron, frustrating, runs himself into the ground, covers every blade of grass, plays with a smile on his face. Supermac on this platform saying, you know, if they left the doors open, he'd run out down Northumberland Street. But he's now started to add goals to his game, Mitch. It's, uh, it's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot we can unpick from the, 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 the whole performance. Uh, but let, let's concentrate on the two things you've asked me about specifically there. The, the, the clash between Loris and Wilson was one that could have gone either way quite easily. Um, and I think they've taken the view. Loris elected to come out of the penalty area, and it was a collision that neither of them could go anywhere. There wasn't intent on either player's um, mind other than to try and win the ball. And in a situation like that, I think if that had been in the box, they would have afforded Loris a little bit more protection. But because he elected to come out of the box, they treated him like an outfield player. And I think that's the thinking behind it. Rightly or wrongly, that's the kind of foul, if you see that in the area, it, it, it won't be given to the, the attacker. <laughs> um, it, it, it very rarely goes that way with a collision like that in the box. But outside of the box, you see it all the time. And and so it, it was interesting. But I thought the composure from Wilson 
to stay on his feet, get hold of the ball and make sure it went in the back of the net, then ask questions later. Play it to the whistle. How many times do we say it to everybody? Play it to the whistle. And that's exactly what he did. He had the intelligence and the wherewithal and the, the awareness to do exactly that. Um, and I thought that was fantastic. Almiron, well, we're, we've talked about him needing end product, and boy, is he now delivering end product. And it comes back to that interview that I've mentioned before, I read with how about two, three weeks ago, where he talked about one of the biggest changes they made with Miggy was his given goes to make runs after he's given to make the go accessible. He kept trying to make runs that you would need a messy to pick him out from after he gave the ball, and he was keeping, he's basically simplified his game. And on, in football, always the best things simple. And now he's doing the simple things. He's executing the extraordinary very, very well. That finish against Everton, top draw finish. That finish against uh, Spurs, he beat the fullback, then had the left-sided centre-back on his case, he beat him, and then skinned him enough to be able to get the ball onto his favoured foot and took it under the keeper. That's a hell of a move, and that's a hell of a goal. From a narrow angle, I think that they were measuring the angles on the telly here. I don't know whether they did back at home, and they said it was something like 13 degrees, that he only had a 13-degree angle to actually get it into the net from that angle. Um, and again, that's probably the width of a football, and he, and he did it. And then come to how, and I think what, in that 5-1 game, when we lost, that was the only time last season, I think you could say, how got tactically outdone. And he returned the favour this weekend. When he started that 11 and everybody's thinking, well, hang on, we've got Joe Linton, we've got Willick, who's going to play where, who's going to do what? Tottenham's perceived strength was their wing-backs and how it turned it into their weakness. The amount of times we were getting behind them and then putting pressure on the back three, who were making some terrible decisions. Bear in mind, they could have easily scored an own goal. We could have easily had a penalty from that back three who looks flat-footed, and all over the place when they had the pressure put on them because we were able to take the wing-backs out of the equation when we had the ball. Yes, there was still a threat when they had the ball, um, but I think how it picked up tactically on where, what Conte had done to him last season and returned it in spades, and I think that game, I can't say enough about the man. Superb. Yeah, fantastic. Great performance uh, from, from the whole team. It has to be said, I saw a heat map uh, for Sean Longstaff, somebody who gets a lot of criticism from a lot of supporters, um, a minor, minor uh, group of supporters, I should add, not not a majority, but um, guy, the guy, you know, put another good shift in. And um, how was, you know, deserves the praise for being able to integrate the new signings into the team, but just bringing on some of those players who'd lost a hell of a lot under under the previous manager. Steve, your take on the Spurs game? Yeah, well, I think I think we we, we talk about the two goals that were scored, uh, fantastic goals from uh, in, in the in the separate ways. Um, I think what we've got to give a lot of credit to was Nick Pope for uh, stop those two shots early on, one from Son and one from Kane, because uh, it, it sometimes goes under the radar. The, the you know you're, you're seeing who's scoring the goals. Well, Miggy's got six. Uh, Wilson got four. However, a, n- a number of goal scorers. You forget about the fantastic saves that he's making. And, and had we gone 2-0 down, which we could have done if he hadn't saved those two shots, um, you know, the game's different. So uh, everybody's contributing right across the team, which we know anyway. But, uh, you know, y- y- you start, when, when you see the, a goalkeeper like him and the defence that we've got, you, you become relaxed, it, it, even 2-1 ahead. You know, years ago, we would have been sort of panicking 2 one going to turn into 3-2 defeat at least. Um, but you, you feel comfortable at the, at the back uh, with, with that, to back five effectively, and I think that's you know it, it's there in the, in the stats. Uh, we've still got the best defense, ten now, but uh, everybody else has got up to eleven. So uh, we've still got the def- best defense in the league, and and that's going to be the the thing that will see us get to where we go because we're gonna we're gonna be getting draws when we we might have lost games in the future, and I I, I think everything looks good uh, for for things going forward, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if we get to the World Cup without having lost a game before then. Um, uh, you know, with the three remaining games. Yeah, it's uh, exciting times and uh, into the heady, uh, the heights of fourth, Stu. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I was, yeah, I've got an opening uh, sentence I would like to say, but I need to cast your minds back to when you and Mitch first started on Instagram uh, and then uh, Steve Hasty joined 
and it was all through lockdown. And if you look at where Newcastle were then to where we are, were now, I'm going to say a sentence now that you'd never thought was possible then. Good evening from the Champions League places. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Because <laughs> that was never, ever going to be uh, considered, was it? But uh, when I did the, the show with uh, Ben and George on Saturday, there was two words I repeated quite often, which was jealousy and fear. Um, and they all come out to play again, didn't they, after, after the game on Sunday, all, all the press with the stats and trying to see Newcastle cheated or contrived. And it, it is, it's fear because it's now, it's, it's like a tidal wave. For those who were young enough, remember going to Whitley Bay of and that, and you know, you used to have the tidal wave machine, like the tsunami effect. That's what's happening with Newcastle now, it's an unstoppable force. And the jealousy and fear will be replaced with envy and respect, same as what Man City have got. And it's going to happen, I think, a lot quicker than what most of us anticipated. I did say in our predictions at the start of the season that I think we'd finish fifth, and I was uh. Not accused of, but it was suggested I was being over optimistic, over positive. But the the way I looked at it, and I'm sure I mentioned it on the show, was there's some teams there in the cartel that were going through transitional periods. I mean, Chelsea was certainly a, a, a club full of uncertainty, wasn't it? With the the way the, the their takeover happened and the money that was there that isn't there. And then Man United are a club in turmoil and Arsenal, although they have exceeded expectations, I think even beyond their own expectations, I can see them falling away. They, they tend to have a tendency in the winter months to disappear. Uh, and so then you've got Spurs, but we've just put them to rest, haven't we? So there's, there's nothing for us to fear in, in that league. Liverpool are having a really bad start of the season, but yes, they're capable of going long, long sequences unbeaten. So that leaves us and we're there and we're in, I think it's looking good for us to be fifth. And at the moment we're in the Champions League places and as uh, Steve Wilkinson just said, realistically we can to remain unbeaten until the break. So why can't we get into the Champions League? But I think now, if, if that is the case, couldn't start the World Cup and we're still sitting fourth, I think many of us would be disappointed if we didn't get into Europe. So the, the idea that the club have, the owners have, etc., the plan they've got, maybe we've just accelerated by a season and that has to go down to Eddie Howe and his coaching staff and the, the meticulous planning they've got, but also to their players for buying into it. Uh, and it's just a marvellous feeling, isn't it? It's, it's, it's great. Everyone just can't wait for the games uh, coming up. I know it's, what, what, four days or three days tomorrow when we're on the show, but Everyone just can't wait for that game. And, and when was the last time we felt like that? So much looking forward to the next Newcastle game. George, your take on the game at the weekend? Oh, amazing, amazing. Uh, I've used the word professional several times on this programme, and that was another thoroughly professional performance from start to finish. In fact, before that, because, um, yes, the Wilson goal was great, but it was contrived. It wasn't an accident. The long ball from Shaw was quite deliberate because they'd been watching videos of Loris coming out of his penalty area and doing exactly what he did with Wilson. And they were going to tempt him sometime and just attempted him at that time, and Wilson picked up on it. And and the fact that they even thought like that is is just... Well, it's new to us. You know, It's just incredible and, and, and really, really deep thinking in, in terms of football. And then some of the play uh, fr from all of them. I mean, uh, uh, but Almiron all the time was was a thorn in the side. His, his pace was really frightening Spurs. Um, and uh, uh, the back five, you know, from Pope forward. Um, Pope had 17 shots on him in the first half. 17 in, in the first half. And... It, it, they never look like scoring, you know. And I, if anything is going to dishearten a, a forward, is when they keep banging away and banging away and, and not getting anywhere. Well, that's what happened to Spurs last Saturday. Uh, and then you 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 see the immense play right across the back with uh, with uh, Shaw, Botman, and Dan Byrne, proving that he is a good left back as as well as a good centre back with a left foot. Um, 
it was just all uh, unbelievable. And then you picked up, Steve, on, on what I, I'm delighted about is that in all of that, how we're still being able to keep a local lad happy and put keep him in the team. So he's now starting to play the football we all hoped he would play three years ago when they were talking about a £40 million pound transfer to Manchester United and all that rubbish. Well, he had to suffer all, all that stuff from Bruce, but he's come out of it and thanks to how he's now... He's now reaping the rewards, and so are we. I mean, it's not just him; it's, it's so are we. Seeing what a team like that, so no, it just magic, Steve, and that's that's only way I can describe it. Yeah, it is magic. Great time to be a Newcastle fan. Uh, we talked about the World Cup, Al Walid. Um, just you mentioning it there, talking about it. The question we got asked last night on the Monday Club on Monday night, sorry, was um, was basically, is the World Cup break? going to be a good thing for Newcastle or is it going to be a negative thing? And what I mean by that is that Newcastle's team have built up a good momentum. We are playing very well with a form team in the Premier League and, you know, stopping that for a month, it could have an adverse effect. Whereas last season, when we had a trip to Saudi Arabia, um, it was it was a boost. It helped the team gel. Uh, how do you think it's going to affect Newcastle this time round? Uh, I think uh, the World Cup affect positive on Newcastle in uh, many ways. Uh, excited. Everybody went to, uh, you know, most of the players want to be uh, like Joe Linton. He, he went, uh, Butman, he's now on the, the lineup, on the, on the squad of Holland. Uh, so this is a, a motive for a player to play and keep playing so maybe they get a chance of pick up by their national team. Also, uh, other teams who have many players on their national teams, they are afraid from injuries. So they will not usually should be play uh, 100%. So I think this is advantage for us. Because in, in Newcastle, I, maybe four players international only, I think. So uh, th I think this is a uh, help. And uh, as a bonus, we have uh, the transfer window. Uh, winter transfer window. And hopefully... Uh, Hopefully, uh, we pick the right players. I still believe we need a, mess, uh, uh, a maverick, the maverick player in, in uh, number 10 position. This will uh, uh, continue. And I think everything will be uh, picked up as we left before World Cup, after the World Cup. OK, same question to you, Mitch. Is the, is the World Cup um, going to affect us? It's going to affect everybody, as uh, al Wali quite rightly Absolutely. says. Absolutely. In the way any help prepares, I think it will affect us least of all. He's already talking about preparing a mini pre-season for people like Isaac to get them back fully fit. He could probably include ASM by that in that, uh, and and any others carrying knocks so he wants to get fit. He'll be treating it like the start of a season. He'll be working on them as as hard as he can and as hard as he dare. It gives the time to reassess what we need in the squad. What will he position at the end of this point? may dictate what they're prepared to spend and what they're prepared to not. Are they prepared to throw the dice to add more into the mix? Um, will it be there's now 80 million to spend instead of 40 million or something like that? Because I don't think the set individual targets or budgets in any way. I think everything is flexible. I've said this all along. And I think it is flexible and movable to react and to pre and prevent certain situations depending on how we are. Um, I think Hedy Howe will look at this break as an opportunity rather than a threat. And then, as Alvaro rightly says, we're then into probably the most unique January transfer window ever, whereby it is like starting the season again, and that January window will be more like a summer window, I believe, and I've said that all along. But I think the, the January window will maybe be treated almost like, it would be like a summer window this time round. And you've got the added, added factor of people who've performed well in the World Cup may suddenly rise to, to recognition and may suddenly be of interest. Or somebody who, before the World Cup, was bigged up and going at an inflated price has a disaster of a World Cup and might actually be available on the cheap. Um, yet that's a sword that can cut both ways. Um, and players don't become bad players overnight, even if they have just one stinking tournament. You know, so I think they'll be looking at opportunities rather than threats all across the board within Newcastle United from top to bottom. And I think that's what this timing of this World Cup does. 
there's still part of me is really not looking forward to watching the World Cup with Christmas decorations up. It just doesn't sit right. <laughs> I, know, I know that's probably nothing new for Stu, obviously, given... <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> nearly all the with the decorations up. <laughs> yeah, um, but, you know, it, 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 it is something that sort of makes this season and this winter break and the January window probably the most unique ever. And, and, and as I say, we seem to prepare on so many different levels. Um, this is an opportunity, not a threat to the Newcastle United. Steve Wilkinson, is it going to affect Newcastle in a, in a positive way or a negative way? Will Cup well, break? I think positively, because I think uh, particularly where, where we are now, and if, if we can uh, maintain and, and be still in the Champions League position or even down to fifth um, when the World Cup's on, it's going to be a great talking point for the players that are there. Uh, we're going to have Shaw, Switzerland. We're going to have uh, Bruno, uh, Brazil, Trippier, obviously, in the England squad. Maybe maybe more. We don't know yet. Um, Botman, I mean, he's got to have a chance to be in the Netherlands squad, I would have thought. Um, and they're going to talk amongst themselves, the, the, amongst the players, and they say, oh, what's, what's going on there? I see Newcastle's fourth top. And it, it's going to give the, the players a chance to to encourage others to say, look, this is a fantastic setup that we've got here. And, and whether we, do, we might not get them in January, um, I, I do think, as Mitch has just said, that it, it there's going to be, I think there's still going to be 21 games left of the season when we get to, we normally it's well past halfway when the, the January window opens. Uh, with that postponed West Ham game, I think we'll be up to 17 by the time January the 1st comes. So there's going to be 21 games left. So it, it's, it's more than half a season. So uh, unlike other years, there's a, there's a long time left. Um, and if you can add the the, the 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 icing on the cake um, in in January to what we've already got. Bearing in mind, we've effectively got another player that we haven't we've already seen Isaac, and already he's got two goals when we've only seen him play three games. Um, you know he's going to come back in as is ESM. Uh, getting that squad strengthened enough to be able to challenge to get into Europe, um, and and I'll I'll not be disappointed if from the position we're in that we end up in the conference or something like that, but. I, I certainly think that uh, it's an advantage having the World Cup. You know, I'm, I'm, I would rather have continuity. I don't, I don't, I don't like the big break, but you know, obviously we'd be able to watch football. But I, I would like it to carry on. We've got that momentum, um, and you fear it might not be. But I, I'm pretty sure that the way that we 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 dealt with the the preseason, it's another preseason for Eddie Howe. We're going to Saudi again, as we did, and that was a big boost last year when we went there. The, 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 the built the camaraderie better than ever and I'm sure that will be the same again so I, I, everything uh, will, will come out good and I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll, uh, we'll benefit from the you know the, the restart when uh, after the World Cup Same question to you Stu Well to carry on from my optimism of Newcastle finishing higher in the league one thing I didn't add in the previous answers was I think this break will help us massively uh, for reasons that I believe mentions just there, that we don't have as many players in in the top end of the league that in the, playing in the competition as others will have. And realistically, that you can imagine it'll be Bruno going the furthest, but he's not even a starter for Brazil. Um, but then, what will work massively in our favour? And I, I took this into calculations when I predicted us to finish at least fifth was the fact that we're not in Europe, and that's going to have a huge effect come January because. There will be every 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 European team will be playing twice a week, whether it be domestically or within Europe. They'll be constantly twice a week, and it doesn't give enough time for training for preparation. Uh, so this is our huge, huge chance. And I know anyhow, very cleverly, uh, he likes to manage expectations by saying, "Oh, we're having three games a week. It's three games in eight days, or traditionally it's two games a week." And that's what we'll have next season if we get to Europe. So he's, he's always sending the message to those above saying, look, I need more strength, I need more money, I'm, I'm overachieving what I've got. It's also telling the fans, look, we're, we're, aren't we doing brilliant? Uh, but he's, he's getting more time than the traditional cartel or the top six because uh, they're all in Europe this season and we're not. So we will have time to, for those little niggles to get more chance to recuperate. We'll have more time to, for his preparation. We'll have more time to rest than any other teams that are competing for the European places. So th to me, really, this is our chance to, to gate crash that party once we're in it. 
I'm more than sure that our owners will give him as much car blanche as he wants, as long as he thinks this person will fit our squad. I'm sure they'll, they'll move heaven and earth to help him get him. So, World Cup for me is, is a cracking team. And I think it's going to be huge, hugely, hugely in our favour come the end of the season. And finally, George, you, your views on this. Well, exactly the same as the lads. I think it's a very positive thing. A um, number of things, getting the lads fit that who, who would need to get fit would be a great thing because they'll add, add strength to the squad and danger to, to, to opposition as well. But the other thing is that I look at it is, is that the game that we play under Eddie Howe at the moment is a high pressing, a very, very physical game that we play. I mean, the, the the Newcastle players are running their legs off at the minute compared to some other teams. And that gives them a chance to re get recharged. And Eddie Howe will take every every minute, every second he's got with them uh, to get them ready for the next game. And, and he'll he'll do it with his, uh, his uh, training uh, group in, in a very sensitive and a very uh, professional way. So I, I, I like the lads think it's, it's a very, um, very positive opportunity for us. And, uh, um, the the rest, the, the, those above us need need to need to look over their shoulder because uh, we're definitely coming. There's no doubt about that for me. Uh, and and this is uh, this break uh, could just cement that really, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, uh, I agree 100. percent Okay, uh, halfway through the program, we always have a little section uh, called Ask George, and as we have nobody in the chat, as this is a pre-record to ask the question. It's over to the lads. Ask George then, Al Walid. What is your question for George? Uh, well, it's going to be uh, the best moment ever for George uh, at uh, any Newcastle game. Best moment. Any. First moment come to his uh, mind. Oh, well, first moment that comes to mind... Uh, in that respect, Al Walid is uh, Malcolm McDonald's hat trick in his debut game against Liverpool. That that takes him getting over. I mean, uh, we'd we'd expect so much of this new centre forward, and and the manager Harvey had, had brainwashed into what to expect of him, and he delivered. He delivered. Uh, that's the only way to describe it. And I can't remember a, a, another occasion when I. Uh, uh, what was expected actually happened on the pitch, and that was that was super Mac. And from that minute on, he was a, he was a hero in Newcastle, there's no question. Okay, Mitch. Okay, one I've never asked, actually asked me, Dad. The worst player you've ever seen in a black and white shirt. Oh gosh. Um, oh, I, th I think I, it's got to be one of the big centre. Oh, that's so Riviere has got to be up there. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you, well, it's true. You, you, you're right, but uh, but in terms of uh, ability on the ball and, and 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 lack of ability on the ball, um, I have to give the prize to Big George Riley. He, he was just plainly awful on the ground. Yes, he he could head the ball and he could do all sorts of things, but he. He just sometimes looked like he'd never played football before. So Big George Riley gets that prize, Neil. <laughs> okay, Steve, have you got your question? Yes, um, I want to go back to the 50s, George. Um, obviously, we're, when, we're, when we get into Europe next season, we'll be playing uh, the, the games under floodlights. Um, obviously, they came in for the first time in the 50s. What's your first recollection of matches at St James's under, under floodlights? Oh, being at the first match against us, Celtic. Uh, when they turned the floodlights on, um, when I think of how how fantastic the light is now, compared to where it was that night at, at St James's Park, it was a pretty foggy night, misty night anyway, so you could hardly see the bloody game. Was, um, that, that, was that just the, the, the just on poles at that time? That wasn't the big yes, pylons, the, was it? No, no, they were just poles around the ground. And I'll tell you where those poles ended up, Steve, around the training ground at Hunters Moor when they took them down to All put right. the pylons on. They took the po they took the poles up the hunt as well at the training ground and, and used them up there. I remember seeing them but, up there. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I, I remember being at that match and the match coincided with the uh I think it was was it the death of Queen Mary, um and the sort of uh did a pre match, you know, thing about that as well. So it sticks in my memory, but it but it was uh 
it was the very first match at St James's, yeah, and and it was uh, now the you know as I say compared to what we look at now, it was it was desperate. I don't know how, how they played it to be honest, but they did. <laughs> so that that's it really. Celtic, the Celtic match, first match. Okay, Stu. Well, I'm going to be a bit rude and ask for two questions, George. One's tongue and cheek, and one's very topical of late. So I'll get the tongue and cheek one out of the way. Who did Mitch and Harry's alcohol intake capability of? Oh, that's easy. That's easy. That's his grandfather, I'm afraid. That's that's Harry. Um, <laughs> uh, Harry could Harry could drink uh, anybody under the table. I mean, Harry was a brown ale with a uh, lamb's navy rum chaser sort of guy. So, um, and he, he was always uh, ready for a drink. There's no doubt about that. In fact, I think I've told stories on here about my cousins from Teesside. When yes, you have. Family, <laughs> when, when there was well, when there was a family family wedding, uh, and and all the young ones used to get together. The ones that were starting to have a drink used to congregate very near Uncle Harry because they knew that Uncle Harry would would get the beers in. Have a have a have a beer, lads. You know, and there's a room. Put that down here. You know, <laughs> and Aye. it was it was a freebie. So he was he was a magnet. Don't get me wrong. Love my father greatly, but uh, yeah, he, he, he could drink. He, he, he certainly could. He had a, a reputation for having a paint, no doubt about it. So right. um, the second one, more topical one, George, is there's been a lot of talk about uh, the Bruno being the best midfielder. But who would you pick, Bruno in his current form or Gaza in his prime? If you could pick one centre midfielder for Newcastle, I think. On margins at the moment, because we've seen guys that at his prime. Yeah. When we see Bruno at his prime, and I don't think it's far away, he, he'll knock he'll knock any, everybody else into a cocked hat. So at the moment, I'd have to go with Gaza because he just was phenomenal out of this world. I mean, who who could forget that that silly flick on over the top of the Scottish defender, and then he bangs it in the back of the net. That that. Comes naturally, you know that that that's that's not taught. Um, well, Bruno's capable of that, but not yet. He's he will see the best of Bruno in another season, and then he'll be the best. I think there's no doubt about that. But at the moment, I think you're right. Gaza's probably just sneaks it. Okay, thank my, you very much. My question is: You've seen a lot of promotions, George, over your time as a Newcastle United supporter. Which was your favourite promotion season? Wow. I'm going to go off piste here and say um, the last one was Rafa. We, wow. weren't supposed, we weren't supposed to get it. We weren't supposed to get that promotion. Uh, half, half the, well, more than half the, the league was thinking that we were, we were a, um, a busted flush. We weren't going to get that. And Rafa really turned some, he done what Howe's done. He turned some very ordinary players into winners for Newcastle United. Um, you know, he, he bought players to do specific jobs and then showed them how to do the job. And uh, uh, yeah, he, 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 we were, it, it was a promotion, in my opinion. The rest of the country didn't think we could get, we were a busted flush. And Rafa just made it possible. And bear in mind, uh, his owner nearly. <laughs> Nearly knackered it for him by refusing to back him in the in the in the winter uh, transfer window. You know, he, how he didn't walk after that, I don't know. But so because it was so difficult at the time, and because uh, it was uh, so many people didn't think we had a chance. Um, I'm going with that one, Steve. Okay, brilliant stuff. Uh, those are some good questions there. Uh, ask George. Uh, we'll be back over to the public uh, the next time we're live. Another question on the Monday Club, Al Waleed, was this one. Newcastle currently sitting in fourth place at the moment, but which would you rather have at the end of the season? Fourth place in the Champions League or eighth place and winning the Carabao Cup? Of course, winning the Carabao Cup. No question. Simple answer to a simple question, Mitch. Is it as simple for you? I think possession of silverware, 
could be as much of a catalyst to Champions League place for Newcastle United the way we've been starved of silverware. And I would take the cup. OK. Steve? I think when, when you said eighth um, in the Carabao Cup, that's fine. But I think, I, if I remember watching the Monday Club, there was somebody talking about 15th. And I don't want to be 15th and win the Carabao Cup because that's something meant that's gone wrong with the season. Um, Carabao Cup will still give us Europe. And I think it, it, it's, it's important that we get Europe. And, I, and I'd, I'd be quite happy to be in the Europa League or even the conference next season. Um, so that we we can build a team ready, get used to playing twice a week, and get, and build a, a really good squad ready for Champions League beyond that. But in in my lifetime, I've uh, I came in 1962, so I've I've seen the first cup, which is a long time ago now. We've have won something. I've had my hands on the cup. Um, so I think I put on once when we, we did it in the past. But uh, for. You know, this this so many years of hurt that we've had. Uh, Sixty years I've been going now, and we've never won a domestic trophy. And uh, so I suppose I, I would like to win the Carabao Cup, and uh, you know that would give us Europe anyway. And uh, if we miss out on being being by being eighth on, on a, a league place that gets us into Europe, so be it. But uh, why not do both? Fifth, last you says, and Carabao Cup. Okay, Stu. It's uh, yeah. I mean, league position is 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 you know beyond our wildest dreams at the moment. We've all got our feet on the ground, of course. But um, um, you know, what what's your view? I, my view is I'd love to win a cup, so I, I would take a lower league position and, and win in the Carabao Cup. To be honest, totally agree. And it's, it's us being selfish, a bit like Steve Wilkinson was there, you know, because he's seen us win a cup. We haven't, uh, and similar to him, I've had my hands on many cups as well. But that's another story. The, the winning the silverware is so so important, and realistically, if even if the question was fifteenth for winning the cup, I'd still see if it take the fifteenth. But I think we've got a much better chance of winning the cup than uh, it's more realistic. We'll win a cup this year than finish fifteenth. I can't see us uh, being allowed to to fall that far now. But winning the cup, and as as I said, that gets us in Europe. But it will put so many uh, things to bed, won't it? You know, I think we've just discussed it before. There'll be many a grown man on Tyneside and far and wide that will be shed a tear that day when they see whoever's our captain uh, raise, a, raise the trophy at Wembley. And, and I just pray to God I'm amongst the crowd to see it. So winning a cup every single day of the week because we win the cup, it attracts players, as Mitch said, it gets us in Europe. And we've got owners now that can help us financially get above 15th the season after. George, um, what's your take on this? It seems like well, an easy question to answer, but you know, yeah, it's, some people don't would... find it as easy to answer. Our lads have, have answered it with the same same answer, more or less. Well, and, and uh, bear in mind, you know, I mean, uh, 76 years watching this team, 70 odd, yeah, 70, 75 years plus watching this team. And yes, I've seen all sorts of things. Um, but I've never felt so positive that uh, we could do something special with this team, with this with this group of people who are running the team and with the team itself. So I'm a greedy little duck. I won fourth and the Carabao Cup. Yay. And I don't see why we shouldn't get it. Fantastic, great stuff. It's an answer which will cause plenty of debate, I think, uh, from you know, from a lot of Newcastle fans. But yeah, I think the trophy is the one thing we wanted. Ross Gregory um, on Tuesday's show um, said exactly the same. You know, he says, I, "I want to be selfish. I want to see Newcastle lift the cup." But yeah, why not be ambitious? Fourth place, like George says, and uh, and winning the cup as well. Um, lots of uh, lots of other things to, to talk about and um, the, the Newcastle United supporters trust I believe have um, obviously been putting it out to their members and, and, and asking them what they you know the, the kind of feedback that you know the, the supporters have got to give them to, to take back to the club um, just to give you an idea uh, Kenny Branson thanks for sending us the email because I'm not a member of the trust anymore um, the feedback that they had from from uh, their their members were ticketing uh, significant levels of feedback have been received regarding Newcastle's online ticketing system. Uh, people feel that a potential ticket exchange program, uh, season ticket waiting lists and priority access should be looked at. Uh, with regards to the ground, 
Um, they say they received a lot of feedback specifically in relation to the potential rebranding or the name and rights partnership. Uh, they also received um, plenty of talk about the capacity increase and also uh, regarding a potential move away from St. James's Park. Uh, no surprise here, they, they got a lot of feedback on Castoria. Uh, the members have provided their views on the price, the distribution, the customer service levels and the quality, uh, along with providing opinion and comment about potential future deals the club may explore. Uh, Matchday Catering was brought up, a standard uh, complaint amongst fans, I guess, uh, to anybody. Uh, members have provided feedback on the quality of the menu choice, along with the desire to have more locally sourced options available on match days and stadium experience uh, views have been shared in relation to safe standing and wi-fi accessibility no surprise again uh, and the feedback regarding the possibility or need for a second tv screen has also been received uh, having been involved at different levels with different supporters groups i've got to be honest none of that has come as any surprise um but yeah i mean what what was what what do you think, Al Walid? Is there anything you would add to that list? Uh, things to improve. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I could say uh, uh, because I most of the year in Saudi Arabia, so I, I wish if, uh, if uh, the trust uh, uh, being overseas uh, trust for uh, for Newcastle fans. As uh, I find hard uh, uh, helping or trying to establish uh, official things uh, uh, lately, so I wish if uh, this expand overseas and especially here in Saudi Arabia, if this I can add. Okay, Mitch, we've spent many a year looking through things like this um you know at fans meetings and you know in our different uh different you know wearing our different hats for different organizations and groups it's pretty much standard fare that isn't it that the people are looking for any change or improvement and like i say it's it, for me it's you know unless unless you haven't got a ticket i guess or you know you're, you're somebody who you know your, your main source of food is, is coming to the club and having some food at the club there's not really anything to really complain about is that at this moment in time if steve hasty was on this panel i'm sure he would agree that myself you and steve wilkinson wearing all the various hats we've worn over the many many years could have probably written that list without even seeing it um, there's very little new or innovative in there. The the, the 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 veiled suggestion that you need to be exploiting local um, sources for food and beverage is basically a big message that says, "Can we have Greg's in the ground?" Yeah. Um, you know, it's 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 things which come up time and time again. Ticketing constant issue. Uh, ground expansion's been talked about for years and. It, until the club are proactive in doing something about it, it's talk. All of that's just talk. I think what they do have is a, an audience who was now prepared to listen. That's something you or I haven't had for a long time, Steve, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, and so I think that that's a positive to look at. I think there are many things you could exploit regionally and locally for the mutual benefit of, of all in the better and enjoyment of fans. Um, Wi-Fi access in the grounds a cracking one. That's probably the only one I wouldn't even be vaguely interested in. But never mind. Um, I'm now showing me age. I'm going to be sitting <laughs> with a bot bottle of brown ale in a, in, a, in a dark room causing nuisance in the corner of a bar again soon. Like my grandfather. <laughs> um, you know, um, it's, it's something which... Um, some of these things just are circular. There's no real right answers. The club can only do the best they can do and try and keep as many people happy and positive and engage with as many people as positive as they can. Yes, they have to engage with the trust as the single biggest ratified body of membership in supporters groups that support them that they do. But equally, that shouldn't be the be-all and end-all. They need to be reaching out further afield than that. And they need to be reaching out to their stakeholders, the, the season ticket holders, if you ask me, in a very much more direct fashion. Um, that's just a personal opinion. Um, because ultimately the trust can only and should only speak for their membership and their membership alone. And there's plenty more people who are not members who then, where does their voice get heard? 
and that's something you and I have talked about again, broken record time really, isn't it? Um, it hurting the cats, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's it, 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 it's it's not surprising that list isn't surprising the things that they've already made some efforts to improve. Amazing what just a lick of paint and a general feel good factor around the place can make a difference. Because at least they show the care. Under Ashley, there was no sign of any care whatsoever, and I think that is, you know, that that is a big step. Um, and, and this is where those lines of communication must be used properly and prudently. Um, I think there's loads of things that could happen, but from the club's point of view, not many of those things are probably their priority at this moment in time. There's a hell of a lot more to fix, and a hell of a lot more functionally, fundamentally, and operationally. To sort out, I think the uh, I think the um, the Castoria one's an interesting one because my understanding is they will be with us again next year, uh, and I don't think that's going to change overnight. Um, now, whether that changes in the longer term, I don't know. Um, my understanding is the training kit is a very interesting Aston Martin green. We'd read into that what you will, but um, I think uh, you know the the. the there's a lot that needs put right in with that, and the club has to take some responsibility for it. Because as I've said before, on here and many other places, the minute they produce something that's got our club's badge on it, whether they like it or not, it's the club's responsibility to sort any issues out, in my opinion. Um, so of all the things, that's probably the most urgent one of the lot, because the rest can just happen along the way, because there's a lot more to do operationally and functionally, in my opinion. Yeah, I would agree, mate. Uh, Steve, your take on um, you know the uh, you know the comments, the feedback that the trust have had. Yeah, I think the the, the key thing, and and we haven't yet seen it properly yet, um, is seeing how Darren Neal's interacts with the fans as he as he did in yeah. Atlanta. Um, yeah, obviously he, he made a start by going on Radio Newcastle last week, but that was a that was a, it wasn't really involving a lot of fan interaction. But I, I think he'd be setting up methodologies where where he goes go out to pubs and clubs and other sort of events to to get direct feedback and and and, and build on that but i think it's also irrelevant to to build a a, a mechanism for communication um i can I, i'll just give you a story that's just got resolved today um and and something that goes under the radar because it doesn't affect many people but the the the, at the brentford game you might recall they had the uh, the server banner uh, flag in the in the leases end and the, the, the twice they've had it there, they take it out via the, the front of the east stand in front of where all the wheelchair positions are. And, and it, it's, a, it's a massive operation that, uh, I don't know, 50, 60 of the, uh, the guys and girls um, pulling it. And it, it was impressive. But what actually happened in that game was, uh, it was when it went past, there was odd bits of flag were, were hanging off. And I thought there was, there was a health and safety issue, potentially, of, of some uh, the, the wheelchair users maybe getting their legs caught in it. Um, because they were trying to move it fast, the game had kicked off, and uh, obviously that was a, affecting the view. But it, you can tolerate that for a minute or so, as long as we don't score in the first minute. Um, so I, I raised it with the club um, through operations and, and through the disability support. And I got a call today, actually, from uh, this morning from uh, I think it's, it's Milan is, uh, is the health and safety officer, Milan Cooper Cooper Sarovic. Um, and that correspondence was great because he, he communicated back and he said that they'd taken on board. He was actually there at the front of this uh, this procession, but not realising what was going on behind it because he was trying to clear the way, which I, I, I recognise him doing that at the time. Um, the outcome being is that I think they are planning when, it, when the next time it's in the leases or any big flags, they'll, they'll take it out to the northwest corner and round the back of the east stand uh, to where they store it rather than going along the front because they... That, that you know they've taken on board that, and I think that's something that just shows that the that the new regime are, are are interested in listening to fans' views on anything. And it, it wasn't a complaint. I mean, it, 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 to me, what War Flags has done is has been part of the success. So I, I, it wasn't a knock at War Flags, but it it's just a little bit of feedback and, and reaction to that feedback and, and getting the the relevant party to, to take notice of whatever the things are and, and putting things right. And sometimes it's simple things like that that can can make the improvements and you you know by doing more and more of them and i i just hope they make it clear that you can if you've got any idea you don't have to go through any any official channel you know if there's a, if there's a helpline or whatever encourage people to be putting comments in and and having people 
because the, if they get enough staff in the right places to 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 respond and 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 make improvements, you know, the sum of all the the big improvement is a lot of some of a lot of little ones, um, and and I think that's that's a good example of where it happened. Yeah. Okay. Great. To point that out, Steve. Thanks for that, uh, Stu. Your your feelings on this? Um, you know, well, is there anything you'd add to the list? No. Uh, when you were reading it out, it sounded like an eight year old's list of Santa Claus. No, it was just like I want this. It was all trivial stuff, and uh, we've got owners. You know, if you, if you give people enough. Uh, a big enough platform you'll always find people who just want to complain about something this is the best state this club has been in with the potential going forward than even Georgia would have seen in his lifetime you know so the Wi-Fi doesn't work great that means you can't be contacted you're there to watch the football watch the football uh, you know if I could add to that list why is the odds of the bookmakers in the ground so much worse than what they are outside the ground because they've got a captive audience. It's just like when you go at the airport, the price of beer is more expensive than it is in the bar. Stop moaning. You know what I mean? We've got owners now who listen more, communicate more, and are, are more aware of what was wrong and, and what they've achieved and what they've fixed in the last 12 months. It's, it's, it seems like some people just want to take it for granted or, or make statements just to, to sound relevant. They, they will listen. They will engage with every different group and, and I'm not a member of the trust, so I'm not knocking them. But it's great that they want to put things forward to the to the board. But it was a bit like the the little list that they put to the Premier League. Say something with bait, have a fight about it. Bait, as in not physically fight, but get if you've got something that really is worth complaining about, get do it properly. Not just oh, we have a list here. What would you like? I don't agree with it. Uh, and talking about the Aston Martin, as Mitch did there, the, the race in green colour and stuff like that. Um, and I mentioned uh, on the other day with Ben and George, uh, I, I really, we, well, I know we've had some information that indicates that there will be some shape or form sponsoring us. But why couldn't the name stand? There's, Steve Wilkes had mentioned there that this this flag got taken off at the Leases end. Is that not the Sir John Hall stand? Yeah. But everyone still calls it the Leases. Uh, the Gallagher, we all call it the Gallagher. Is it not the exhibition stand? Yeah. Right, so would it make any difference if they made the East stand or the old stand or the new stand, depending what area or era they're from, if they made that the Aramco stand or the Aston Martin stand or the Uber stand or whatever, and it brought more money into the club? You know, these are still, if you want to complain about something, get something good to complain about. Not just a little... Uh, sorry, I don't. I don't even mean to run because we're, we're we're in such a good place. But it's like you give people a type of mode about something. It is Jesus difficult. It? It, it does like, get it up. I don't get over yourselves. Oh, but, but, but please, just you want to add to the list? Yeah. Well, put the put the bookies on the list. Uh, how come you can get five to one outside the bookies and there's three to one in, uh, inside the ground? You know, and every Greg sausage roll should have a Heinz tomato ketchup with H.E. brown sauce if they do get Greg's in there. I mean, it's it's to me, it's it's just a bit over the top. It's, it is the eight-year-old Santa's Christmas wish list. Look at where we are. Look at where we were, and look at where we're going. And if there's a little niggle, life isn't perfect. You know, we don't just live in those ninety minutes. Life isn't perfect. I would say, but they're making this support in your castle as seamless as possible. You know, let's not just irritate them because it, it would be so much annoying if every time you try to make big changes. The seismic changes that we've talked about, the the bigger fish to fry that Mitch just alluded to there, and you've got like some annoying little thing pulling on your shirt tail saying, ah, "What about this? What about this? Stop it! Let them get on and, and and do what they're doing. They're making our club great. Just yes, engage with them, but don't sound so petty, and let the kids write the list for Santa. That's it. I, I really thought it was stupid, uh, as you may have gathered. Let the kid write the let the kids write the list for Santa, George. Um, yeah, well, what, what what's your take on it, George? Well, um, I mean, Stu's summed up what I would have said as well. But there's there's one or two technical issues which need to be dealt with as well. If you want great Wi-Fi, the last thing you do is you surround everybody with a concrete box. I mean, it's like a bloody um, 
It's like an atomic bomb shelter in St. James's Park. No wonder you can't get good Wi-Fi. It's just a technical matter. And, and as Stu said, well, they'll sort it out if it needs sorting out. If it can't be sorted out, well, hard lines. It's not going to spoil the game for me because I can't get my phone during the match. And the other one is the uh, the ticketing system. Surely, surely, that's just a bloody software problem. There must be there must be a software engineer in the northeast of England. In fact, give it to me and I'll take it to the university. I'll get a couple of postgrad computer scientists to come and sort it out for them. And in a fortnight, they'll have a new ticketing system. I mean, that's how, that's what it means to me. I'm 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 disappointed that they're stuck like that with such a problem. If we're trying to, to solve the, the the national debt, I would say, well, okay, but we're not. We're just trying to sell some tickets for a bloody football match. I mean, you know, it it gets my goat a little bit. And the other thing is, is that, and I may be speaking out of turn. I understand that a certain Mrs. Stavely and a certain uh, director have already got meetings penciled in to talk to the local authority and the university about the stadium. That's my understanding. Now, I might be I might be speaking out of turn and somebody at the university is going to come and kick me shins when I go in next Monday morning, but I don't care. That's my understanding, is that meetings are already penciled in to talk about the stadium. So, Steve, can I just add, now, uh, do you know if Amanda Savely becomes Merry Christmas and she takes this list and she says, waves a magic wand and says, okay, I'll give you everything you want, but it's going to cost an extra five on the ticket for each game. Who's the first that's going to complain about it? The ones that wrote that bloody list. It's, you, know, you can't get everything you want in life for free. You know, so what do you want? You go to the match to watch your team win and play well, and we've got that. And yes, it would be fantastic if the Wi-Fi worked. It would be fantastic if everyone who wanted a ticket got a ticket. Uh, and it would be fantastic if we all got what we wanted in life. We don't. Just take the good. When things are going well, accept it. Don't look for faults. Don't look to bring it down. Because in any relationship, if one person's really trying, the other one just complains all the time. It won't work. No, let's well, get behind them. Let's support them. Could I come back on something else I was going to talk about, Steve? Yeah. If uh, they mentioned uh, uh, another TV screen uh, in, in the ground. Well, anybody that went to those opening game of the World Cup, the Rugby League World Cup, like I did, would see a fantastic screen in the Gallagher end. A huge one. And it was great. I've got to say, it really was fantastic. The other thing that was fantastic was, it was great to see the Rugby, rugby, rugby League people operating the playback system. Question something, 30 seconds later, the game was being played again, not like farting around like VAR does in the, in the football. But there was a lovely, great great big screen at the, in the Gallagher end um, in front of where the restaurant thing windows are, Steve. Yeah. Uh, lads, you know what I mean? At the, at the, at, I'm, yeah. I'm in the laser's end in the right-hand corner of the Gallagher end. There was a huge screen and it really... The brewery really, side. Yeah, it really did. Yes, it really did make a difference. Yeah. Mm. yeah but listen, then it's six I've, had, I've, had, I've had communication from John Woff. He's got you know plenty of good ideas. He's he's just you know unfortunately uh, tried to put a few things to to various people at the club, but seems to to get no answer. So hopefully that will change. Uh, John Woff's got a hell of a lot of experience. Um, you know, in in you know things with Newcastle Newcastle United's history, I'd like to think that uh, they might open the door to John at least for a meeting. So uh, maybe it's just taking a, a few of these incumbents into the new positions to get their, uh, their their backside settled on the chairs. But you know, John's a good guy. Okay, let's look ahead to the game uh, at the weekend. Uh, Mitch, I won't ask you for a prediction, um, but uh, you know we'll keep that for the dice on Friday. Uh, but just looking ahead. Aston Villa, Alba lead. Come to you first, mate. Um, they had the bounce after sacking Gerrard. They won 4 0 against Brentford. Um, I normally would be saying, oh, we have to be careful with this game, but I've got complete competence in Eddie Howe. I, I don't think he will let the, the players get um, too, too confident, too cocky, too complacent. I think he'll have the team drilled and ready to go. And, and again, I think Newcastle will. You know, we'll we'll come out on top in this game. What what's your views on the game? Is it going to be a tough one, Albany? 
Uh, of course, uh, as you said, the back clash and uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Unai Emery will coach Aston Villa. Hey, well, yeah. Unai, Emery, Unai Emery, it's going to be, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so it's yes, going to be like. A... But he's not yeah. on Saturday. Yeah. No, but he's taking the job. He's taking the job, but he'll not be there on Saturday. Yeah, he can't oh. because of his work permit. Yeah. Ah, okay, so good. So, because, you know, we remember the competition between. They, they were the last two names uh, before we heading the coach for Newcastle, and it was uh, President, uh, Chairman of Newcastle, who picked uh, Eddie Howe over Unai Emery. So. Uh, maybe the next uh, next game, but I think uh, Unai Emery regret that he didn't come to Newcastle. I can't say that. I can't see that. So uh, uh, I think the confident after Tottenham uh, increase in Newcastle, and we didn't reach that level to be you know uh, uh, overconfident yet. So I think it will be fine. I think we will win. Mitch, uh, tough, tough game. But like I keep saying on you, every single game is tough in the Premier League if you let your standards slip. Yeah, but I think that result against Brentford and that previous two performances tell me one thing. That's a squad of players who have stopped playing for the manager and that raises questions about their character across the board. And how will they react to the appointment of a new manager? They're all now going to be playing for their own places and their own skins. Um, so it might actually be they've got the bounce out of their system it might actually be a good time to play them that's my feeling I mean I watched the game against Fulham um, the, the sort of extended highlights of that and I'm sorry that that own goal by Mings that was deliberate for me look at his body position he's not trying to clear that ball he's letting it, he's letting it go in often and I'm sorry you get players like that in the squad there's, there's something to exploit I think if we get into them early and upset them early, the heads will go down and they're there for the take. Okay, Steve, we'll come to yeah. you. Villa at Villa at home. Um usually a usually an interesting game this one. Um it's got a bit of extra spice though because uh, you know the, the players from Aston Villa will be looking to impress. They did against Brentford. How do you see this one going and what's your prediction? Yeah, well I think uh, as as Stu said, I think the uh the, 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 getting a, a, a good start is, is critical. They, they got that on Saturday against Brentford. I think they were with three 0 up in about quarter of an hour, and I think that's the that, that that gets you going in the game. And I think we, if we start positively like that, I think the heads will drop because I I cannot see them changing the way they've been playing for for lots of months and the. Um, Steven Gerrard overnight. All right, uh, you know that was a, that was a, a, a good win. But we 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 put plenty of goals past Brentford, so they're, they're not the greatest team in the world at, at the back. Um, but I think uh, you know the, the momentum's there with us just to carry on and uh, and, and just you know they they like I did earlier on, saying there's only three games left. We can continue to be unbeaten and, and possibly even win all these last three games. There's no reason, you know. I'm looking forward to to, to perhaps beating them, beating Southampton, and then having a Almost a, a practice Carabao Cup final against Chelsea on the on the last game and and uh, putting Chelsea to the sword like we've done with Tottenham on uh, on on Sunday, so uh, I think we'll be be comfortable winners. I think three 0 it'll, it'll be the score on on, the, on Saturday, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Miggy gets on the score sheet again. Okay, good stuff, Stu. Hey, just to clarify something, and I'm sure Mitchell vouch for this. We had it on very, very, very good authority at the time that Emery was never offered the job. He was interviewed, but he was never offered the job. But don't let that spoil a good story. Um, also, if we win on Saturday, Eddie Howe surely is a show in for manager of the month. And that's something that has been mentioned. And considering we had two of the cartel away this month, you know, you've got to see a fair play the way that the, the team have responded to the urgence. Um, as you know, I've already got me 3-1 bet on. And had Gerard still been in charge, I would have said 4-0. But we could be a victim of our own success, as it's proven with like, the, the Bournemouth, Crystal Palace, etc. And teams will fear us and they will come to set up the stall. And it is up to us. The onus will be on us to break them down. Um, but I, if, if we score first, which I'm sure we will, they have to come out. And then it's, it goes one or two ways. We win 2-0 or we go nap and win 4-0. But uh, I'll settle for 2-0 on Saturday and keep fourth position. OK, George, last but by no means least, how do you think well, it's going to go? I, I think they'll be supremely confident and it'll just be too much for Aston Villa, in my opinion. 
uh, and it could easily be three or four nil uh, on Saturday. The other thing, going back to Emery, um, I've, I've got a feeling whether he was offered a job or not, I don't think he would have taken it because I think he thought we were relegated and he didn't fancy going down in the championship. So I don't think he would have took it even if he'd been offered it because uh, that's that's not where he wants to be. He wants to be uh, Champions League. He wants to be in Europe. He wants to be this, that and the other. Uh, and if he thinks he's going to get it with Aston Villa, well, good luck to him because I think he's going to be he's going to be disappointed. Um, so yeah, I mean that that that's my take, and I think uh, it'll be a, a confident win uh, on uh, on Saturday as as far as I'm concerned. Um, can I go back to the the, the questions Drew <coughs> Penman put to us about uh, Neil Sobriety? <laughs> go on, yeah, good good well, place to finish, George. Well, I don't believe me. No, well, well, when I know they're going out, you see, I sit at home thinking, oh, I hope he's careful, I hope he's careful. In the back of my mind, there's a little Harry saying, go on, soon, have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Great place to finish uh, the show. Uh, fantastic. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks to the moderators. Uh, thanks to those in the chat. Uh, but especially thanks to the lads. I will lead Mitch, Steve Wilkinson, Stu Penman, and George, I'm going to play out with the ads. Until the next time, take care, lads. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thanks, thanks again. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. A big thanks to all our sponsors, starting with Skips and Bins, telephone 0800 2545 253, email inquiries at skipsandbins.com, website skipsandbins.com, easy contract free and pay as you go waste collection. Uh, thanks to Darren Baldwin Funerals. You can find them at 304 Old Durham Road on Gated. Uh, telephone 0191 478 273 or email Darren at darrenbaldwinfunerals.co.uk or the website darrenbaldwinfunerals.co.uk. Thanks to Garden of Healing Dispensary, CBD Hemp and Cannabinoid Specialists. Their website is the gohd.com. And thanks to Three Property Investments, who specialise in sourcing investment properties for their clients who are looking to invest in the Northeast. They offer a full in-house service from sourcing the deals to managing the properties for you. They've done over 100 plus deals in the past 12 months for clients all over the UK. Give the guys a follow on Instagram, matty.patter underscore northeast property and phil.read underscore northeast property or email phil at threeproperty.co.uk should you be interested in getting a good property deal. Thanks to Mr. Vicky's Sources, which are handmade in Cumbria. You can order them by going to the website, mrvickys.co.uk or by calling 01768 210102. Thanks to the guys at Blue Hole Brewery. You can find them at blueholebrewery.co.uk. Got a vast range of beers. They're a new brewery company uh, and their cans are suitably uh, addressed like the Jolly Juice here in the strips of Newcastle United from the 90s. Big thank you to Media Arts for all the help with the video side of things and to qtechshop.co.uk, the makers of pool tables and snooker tables in Walls End, Newcastle and the guys who run our website. If you want to subscribe, then hit the subscription button. If you want to hit the likes, then hit the thumb up and please share your uh, social media. We're also available as a podcast on iTunes and Spotify and the rest goes up 24 hours after the show has finished. If you want to join, well, you can click join underneath the video and become a member for a small fee. If you want to pay the £25 fee and get a cup, a pen, a scarf, a membership card and entry into the monthly draw, then go to the website, nufcmatters.com, and click membership or use your smartphone on the QR code, which will take you straight there. We also give you a free car sticker. If you're a subscriber, simply email john at nufcmatters.com to claim your free car window sticker today. We also support the food bank on here, nufcfansfoodbank.co.uk is where you can find the match day bucket and make a virtual donation 365 days of the year. We still do a lot of events in and around the region. If you want to see Super Mac pre-match and after match, you can go to the Dog and Parrot in Newcastle and uh, hear Malcolm give his views on the uh, game and uh, and listen to what he has to say about his career as well. Always a great afternoon. Kids are welcome. Good food, good beer. And get yourself into Pumphreys. Uh, you can always see John Anderson and John Gibson in there pre-match on the cloth market in Newcastle. A couple of events coming up in 2023, an evening with Peter Beardsley, Friday the 10th of February at St. Dom's Catholic Club. You can get the tickets direct from the venue. And Peter Beardsley is also at the Tyneside Irish Centre on Friday, February the 17th. Tickets available from Woucher for that one. Get yourself on a Woucher, make a cracking Christmas present for any Newcastle fan. 
Also, an evening with Rob Lee, Lee Clark and John Beresford, Friday the 2nd of June 2023 at the Grand Hotel in Gosforth. Uh, tickets for that are available from www.healandtour.org.uk forward slash events. And if you fancy a Christmas jumper, get the Bruno Christmas jumper from NUFCmatters.com.